Today, I'm talking to Dan Insel of Montecito in Santa Barbara, California. Dan is ranked number one in sales in his local MLS, and for the last 15 years, he has ranked as one of the top 10 brokers worldwide at Berkshire Hathaway. After completing his law degree with training in contracts, tax, real estate law, and estate planning, and passing the bar exam, Dan started his first career as a practicing attorney in Los Angeles. Eventually, now over 30 years ago, he transitioned to his career today, to being a real estate agent. Despite all of the moving parts of our business and his tremendous success as a top agent in his city, the country, and the world, it is clear talking to Dan, whether about hiring, deals, winning business, closing business, that he has a way of keeping things simple, keeping traction and upward trajectory toward his goals. In our conversation, with or without trying, he reveals how to gain clarity as you grow. Thanks for listening to the Jerry Metcalf podcast, where top real estate agents tell how they do it. This podcast was created for real estate agents across the country to come together, sharing ideas to take your, their, and our business to the next level. All right, everybody. It's the Jerry Metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it. And today we have a top real estate agent in Montecito, California with Berkshire Hathaway, Dan Insel. Dan, thanks so much. Or Dan Insel, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Jerry. Looking forward to it. So tell us a little bit, let's get started on how in the world and why in the world you got in this business in the first place. Sure. So um, I had gone to college in Santa Barbara, fell in love with it. Goal in my life was to move back to Santa Barbara. But after college, I went to law school at UCLA practiced as an attorney for a couple of years down there, but still wanted to move back to Santa Barbara. Tried to figure out what sort of career would allow me an opportunity to make a good living here and something that I wasn't paid hourly. So I didn't have limits on how much money I could make. If I really was willing to work really hard, I wanted a career that would financially compensate me for working really hard if I was good at it. So real estate seemed to be a good natural career path for me. So getting into the business I mean, now let's do a quick brief for everybody who's listening to this on facebook and didn't get the intro you are a you are one of the top you're in the top 10 i think at berkshire hathaway or give us a little bit of your accolades um how well you do with business so i've been in the top 10 of all berkshire hathaway agents in the world for 14 of the last 15 years I'm the number one overall producer in the Santa Barbara MLS also for total, total production over, uh, over my career. That is, so that makes you actually a top agent in the country, by the way, everybody, he's not mentioning that part, but I just know that based on numbers alone. Um, so you've been incredibly successful and you've been in the business for what? 30, 33 years. 30 years. Yeah. 33 years. Yes. So 33 years as an agent, you get in the business. It's very different now, but coming, but regardless, it's whether you're starting now or whether you started then this business is, has its challenges to get into it and to stay at the top of your game. So start us with coming into business. What was it like? How did you get traction and what made you successful? So when I, when I first started selling real estate in Santa Barbara, to me, it felt like every agent here grew up here and knew everybody in town. And I was new to town and new to the business. So felt like I was a severe disadvantage in terms of contacts there. So tried to make up for it by doing a lot of good creative advertising, advertising in places that other people didn't advertise, uh, coming up with good ads that I wrote myself that really sort of treated my ad like almost like a business resume. So people would look at it that, hey, you know, hiring a real estate agent is a job opportunity. Here's my resume. I want that job. Here's why I'm the best qualified person for it. So that's sort of how I looked at it, is really treating it like a business and coming into the town here because people had been here so long and they were pretty settled in their ways. They didn't really treat it that way. I think they more relied on the contacts they had. So I had to start fresh. So I had to sort of come up 
with a little more innovative way to market myself and distinguish myself from the other 1,500 agents in town. There's so a lot. 1,500 agents in town. And do you happen to have on hand how many transactions a year out of those 1,500 agents? Uh, it's less than 2,000. So it's not about again, one, agent, one deal per agent. One deal per agent. If you look at it, it's 1,500 transactions. So 3,000 sides. So maybe a little less than two transactions per agent on average. So the pie is a certain shape pie. You want to make sure that you get a good percentage of that. Because I don't think there's really opportunity here to increase the size of the pie. It's just opportunity to take a bigger slice of that pie for yourself. And so coming into business, you are coming into a market where people hire who they know. It's very much of rubbing elbows or people want to know you and be, and that's kind of luxury real estate agent, real estate as well. How, what, how did you kind of break that glass ceiling of break, or how did you break? What do you think it was that broke you into the industry? Was it time with the people? Was it a different perspective? Was it a way that you got to help shift them, see what they saw? I know you did the resumes, but yeah. For me, the biggest thing I had going for me was educational background. I had got my law degree from UCLA. I had practiced law in Los Angeles. So I had training in real estate law, contracts, estate planning. Most agents in here didn't have that sort of, you know, postgraduate educational background that I did. So I really tried to leverage that as much as I could in terms of distinguishing myself letting sellers and buyers know that their real estate transaction was for most of them, one of the most important transactions financially they would ever do. And letting them know that by and large, most agents charge the same fees. So if, the, if whether you're a buyer or a seller, if the agent is charging the same fee, why not pick somebody who's the most qualified to represent you? Because it's not gonna cost you anymore. But on the flip side of that, if you hire just anybody and they make a mistake, it can cost you plenty. So that was sort of my, always my advertising campaign is it costs you no more to work with the best, but it can cost you plenty if you don't. That was a very effective, you know, people still remember that, but that was sort of one of my early, you know, early advertising campaigns there. So, I mean, great point and so true. And so to that, you know, it's just competence, sheer competence. Even as a new agent, you honed in, you found what you were good at and you applied it to the industry or to what you did throughout and helped, you know, Elon Musk is really big on perception becomes reality. He's not the only one, but that's very much the case here. And you had your skill set. So what do you find? You came in, your strength was obviously your education and your experience in law and understanding real estate law. What has become your strength over the years and how has your business and your business model shifted from 33 years ago to today? So one thing that took me longer than most good agents to learn was that listings are the path to being a long-term successful real estate agent. I loved working with buyers when I first started out. I was super enthusiastic about being, you know, the chamber of commerce tour guide and showing them around telling them how great Santa Barbara and Montecito were and all that. And then I realized over time, and it took me longer than it should have, is that most of them never end up buying anything. And I'd watch other good agents and they had listings and those listings almost always sold. So I made a very conscious shift to being more of a listing agent. And, and, and again, it's been you know, necessary to be a good productive agent to, to make that shift there because probably 90% of my listings sell and probably 25% of the buyers I work with end up buying here. So it's easy to figure where to spend your time and energy in terms of, you know, allocating your, your valuable resource, which is your time. So listings were, you know, what I, what I learned was sort of my path to being a successful agent. So is there anything you did to shift from buyers to listings? Was it just a matter of marketing? Was it a matter of how you marketed it? What was your biggest challenge in doing that? So when I decided to shift to listings, I decided to start doing farming. And so I created a newsletter that I did quarterly and I picked areas that I liked and I wanted to work in. And then gradually over time continued to expand that newsletters. So currently we send out over 40,000 newsletters a year. So I mean, we, 
we are big on newsletter and I write the letter myself, try to make it a really value added letter in terms of what's going on nationwide and then locally. And then, then there are little sub markets. We break the letter down into lots of different sub market letters there. So it gives people a good idea of what's going on in their marketplace, not only what's gone on, but then also what I anticipate is going to be happening in the future. So the thought is, is that people look at it as a good value added newsletter that they see. And I enjoy sort of researching the economics of what's going on locally and nationally. So I try to make it a really good, helpful newsletter, but I've been doing it for 30 years. So very, um, very familiar with it at this and you do, How often do you do this newsletter again? Every quarter. Okay. So this, yeah. that's a lot of newsletter, but that's, a, it's a great, and I think the key is probably consistency. Consistency. We get it out the first week at the start of each quarter there. And so they know to expect it there. And it's always in the same format so they can sort of easily look at it and then refer back and see based on my predictions, how accurate I've been. And um, so again, I think it becomes very helpful for them to see what's going on in their, in their neighborhood. And then also sort of match how that what's going on in the, on the national level. And how does the, how does your market compare do you does it tend to kind of go up and down ahead behind or with the national market or what does that look like so nationwide i think people move every five to seven years on average in our market it's every 20 plus years so people land here and they don't move so it's a very different market we don't have a move up market like most areas do so you sort of get one, maybe two shots at a client in your career. It's not like they keep moving every couple of years. So it's very different than, than most markets here. And part of that is driven by, it's never a job that brings people here. It's always quality of life. And so they come here with the amount of money that they have. And that usually doesn't change very much. So they've sort of land with what they've got and they don't really move up or down in that typically unless, you know, uh, you know, something happens later on in life and they either need to something, a bigger home or want to be on the beach or need a smaller home or a single level. But it's not a, it's not a typical move up market like most, you know, communities have there. So ours is, is fairly unique in that. So like other second home markets, you don't exactly have people, people buying out of a sense of urgency or necessity. No, no. Again, it's, it's a very discretionary purchase for almost all of them. We have really good schools too at the elementary level. So a lot of it in the past has been school district driven where somebody will move a family, a young family here for the school district so they can have their kids go to a excellent public or private school. We see people move here for both, but we have excellent you know, public and private schools here. Wow. So let's talk a little bit more about your business today. So you're selling, um, you know, you're, you're the top agent in MLS in Montecito and you are, is it, are you a one man show or what is your, what does the support of Dan and sell look like? I have two awesome assistants who are both licensed. They don't sell, but they certainly help quite a bit. Now we, well, first of all, I want to jump to something I know you've got some great advice for us on working with people before I jump too quickly to that. What does the structure of your team look like? What is your job? And what is the role of each of your assistants? Sure. My job is as much as possible to be the one who handles the showing and interfaces with the clients. That's as much as possible. The other one person covers weekends. I don't usually work on in the office on weekends there. And so they would cover showings on the weekend. And then the other is really helping with marketing, advertising, overflow showings. Um, but again, I would always be the primary but if I'm off doing something else and something needs to be done, they're both exceptionally capable at covering whatever needs to be done. And what about transactions, paperwork, listing entry, all of that fun stuff? Closing. They handle all that. Yes. So your over you, so is your weekend showings? Is that is she just she he just weekends or? Um, so one covers weekends and a little bit during the week. The other is strictly during the week. That's gotcha. sort of the, yeah. So question on that, I think all of us in luxury real estate have the challenge of when, you know, when the client hires, they want you. Mm -hmm. But of course, we all at some point need to sleep or every once in a while we go yeah. to town. 
when you've got, how do you set those expectations with clients? Because you do have someone showing weekends. So that gives you weekends. How do you properly set expectations so that, you know, you're saying the number one agent, obviously being number one helps, but give us a little bit of feedback on how you established and maintain that. So at the time I take the listing, I explain to them that I'm there during the week and that I'm available seven days a week, but on weekends, it would be one of my two associates who does the showing. So I let them know up front there that, again, I'm available by phone, but during the weekends, it would be somebody else doing the showings there. So I don't think you could do it 33 years, seven days a week and not have burnout. And I don't have any burnout, but I attribute to that to probably the last 15 years, really not doing many showings on weekends. It would be very rare that I would. That's something like this, the most simple, well, it seems simple thing to do, but some of the best advice perhaps ever. How easy is it to just tell yourself, oh, I'm just, I'm just gonna do this one. And the next thing you know, burnout hits, expectations haven't been set and you're in for trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we talked about hiring the right people, leveraging the right ways. How have you, cause you've had these two assistants who it sounds like they're pretty amazing. They are, yeah. So it's gotta be. Yeah. What we typically do when we're going to do a long-term hire is um, you do the initial interview process and make sure that it seems like a fit and what their long-term goals are match up with your long-term goals. But then the probably important thing that you and I discussed briefly is a test called the Wonderlick test. And that is- an We've got to say that again. Spell that for us. The I believe it's W- U-N-D-E-R-L-I-C-H. I think it's Wunderlich. I'm going to make sure, everybody. W-N-D-E-R-L-I-C-H. Yeah. W-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-C-H. That's actually a motorcycle. Okay. It's a BMW does, motorcycle. Does it show up as a Wunderlich test? Oh, it's W-O-N-D-E-R-L-I-C. So wonder, like I wonder. And then L-I-C practice test. Okay. And it's the ability test, a popular assessment used to measure the cognitive ability of problem solving aptitude of prospective employments for a range of occupations. It is awesome. Can't say enough good things about it because yeah. a lot of people can have good skills or good grades in school or good work experience, but in real estate, the multitasking skills are absolutely necessary for what we do. And the Wonderlick test is a fantastic predictor of their ability to do that. Fantastic ability. So, so go ahead. How I, do you know? How do you know? Just not to chat, I, but how do you know it's so great? Like how do you know? Do you have any examples of it? I do. I, 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 I can test well. Yeah. I can tell you that over the years, you know, sometimes, and I've been giving it to people for at least the last 20 years, and there's been plenty of times where somebody's interview skills are so great that I'm willing to overlook their low score on the Wonderlick test, and it's just always come back to bite me, where they're just not capable of doing the job. You need to have somebody who scores in a certain range um, if they're going to, you know, not have create heartache for you and themselves down the road in terms of what what our job really entails for for us in this in this office here for sure and i'd say it's got to be very similar for most real estate people if you're looking for a really good assistant to represent you and do the job that you need to have done they sort of need to score in that 25 to 30 range in the wonderlick test so much below that it's they just aren't capable and above that it's not always good either. So a good score, I mean, a great score, like, you know, something in the high thirties is not necessarily good either. So they're overqualified. They won't stay with you. There must be some other reason that they're looking for that job instead of being the person that's in, uh, already above you in that. So there, there's something else that's missing, but it's a fantastic predictor. A brilliant test. Okay. So just curious, have you taken the test? I have. How did you, were you in the hot thirties? <laughs> yeah, I think 37, something like that. I wasn't like in the forties or something, right. but, yeah. um, but you, you sort of anything below 25 probably is not going to be a fit for you. It's, but and it's almost like if you score too high, you might be too ADD. Kidding. Something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause you've got to be able to be able to divert attention. 
I think in this business and problem solve. Yeah. An assistant. And, and they give it to professional athletes also. Most commonly, it probably is like football players. And the average quarterback scores in that same sort of, you know, mid 30s range, and the average lineman scores under 10. I mean, there's a huge difference in, but that's what their skill set, you know, a quarterback needs to do a lot more than a lineman does. Wow. You know, so they, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have the same, you know, expectation of what their score should be because they don't need to do the same job for you, you know, um, on the football field. That's so interesting. How did you discover this test? One of my friends who owns a small business said, you have to use this. He uses it for all, everyone he interviews there. Um, I will be using this test because yeah, it's, like, it's yeah. a 12 minute test and wow. it's 50 questions. And the test is designed that you're really not supposed to finish it. Most people don't. Most people don't even come close to it. But what you are supposed to do is answer as many questions as you can in the 50 minutes and use your time well to figure out which ones you can get through easily and which ones are going to bog you down. Same with our business. I mean, a lot of times you have to prioritize. It's all important, but which is more time sensitive? This test sort of, you know, filters out people who are good at that. Yeah, so you've, so, so true, because I'm sure as, as an agent, there are certain assistants I've had where I find myself saying, look, this is what's important. You know, and then you're spending so much time doing things because their brains aren't doing it because they didn't take the Wonderlook test. Yeah. And again, it's all important, but what's time sensitive? And that's what a lot of people can't figure out is like, what needs to be done first? What can wait till later today? And so having that ability, I think, is it makes it a much better use of your available time and how much you can actually accomplish during the day. So what you've given us, here's what my... Dan, this is my assessment on you. Like you are a creative person, but you disguise that. You've got a lot going on, but you have this way and tell me of going, okay, here's because there's no way you're a top agent in Montecito and you don't have a lot going on, but you have a way of, com of compartmentalizing could be the wrong word. Tell me, but going, okay, this is everything. And you have this way of organizing it and simplifying it keeping it clean, simple, and concise to get it executed and taken care of. Would that be a fair statement? That would be a fair statement. I think having been an attorney and going to law school sort of trains you in terms of organizational skills. I think that school teachers tend to do really good in this career. Paralegals tend to do really good in this career because they're just good at organizing and prioritizing. And so they think that's sort of a valuable skill set for being a busy real estate agent in addition to people skills. So going from a new agent, organizing to become successful, what were your breakthroughs in continuing that momentum? And Because you've got to organize on one level as a beginner, and then you've got to shift and adjust what you do. You don't get there how, like when you progress in life, everybody who can't see, like you're, let's say at the bottom, and as you're going up to the top of the mountain, as you go through your sections of, tr of progression, at some point to break through the next glass ceiling, you can't get to the next level by doing what you did to get where you are. So what were, what were your lessons? How did you shift? I was always very competitive, Jerry. So, um, which I think in this industry, you know, if you're going to be a top agent, you're competing with other top agents. And, you know, so I was always very competitive in the company that I had worked for prior to Berkshire Hathaway always ranked their agents, you know, and there was probably about 1500 of them. And if you were in the top 10, your rank, again, the notoriety that you got and the accolades that you got was far different than if you were even a little bit below that. So to get to that little extra level, agents that were sort of right at the cusp were willing to work a lot harder um, for that. So I think that was always a good motivator for, you know, uh, in my earlier years in, in the industry there is trying to break into and stay in that sort of top 10 position amongst those agents there. So I think just sort of being competitive by nature um, helped me. That's your why. Your why is because you were motivated, but your what, for, I, I'll give you an example. In my business, I used to just make calls, churn deals, get the next one, get the next one. Now they're coming to me. So I shifted in going for the deal to selecting the deals to work on and carefully organizing 
my files, my processes, how I do things, how we engage to continue to improve the experience. Mm -hmm. get, that's where we, before it was just, just win them, just win them, just get them in, we'll get them through. You get to a certain level, that's, you've got to deliver better and leverage people to do that. Um, but did you have any ahas in your career on that? You're, so, just, you're so organized, you're a natural, that's, the, that's it, but go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Well, like you said, again, when you're first starting out there, you're trying to generate leads and generate clients, and then the longer you've been doing it, then you have the luxury of being able to pick and choose which clients you will work with and which are the best use of your time there. So getting to that stage where you have the ability to pick and choose which clients, which buyers and sellers are the best use of your time. I think obviously gets you to the next, keeps you at that next level there. Because again, when you're first starting out, you sort of have to do everything, even if a lot of them are sort of dead ends, but at your stage in the business, you know, which ones are likely going to be dead ends. And so you don't spend your time on those. You spend your time on the ones that are sort of the, the better use of your time, the more likely ones that are going to lead to a successful outcome. So again, that's just sort of a natural progression of having more options. And that, that's, you know, it's always been the goal of my marketing and advertising is to have more options, you know, who to work with, who to spend my time with. Um, you know, it's just, it's almost been um, a necessity to sort of get to this level is to have better options there. And that's really, you know, people say, well, why do you still market and advertise? You've got all the business you can handle. But if I keep marketing and advertising and can continue to pick and choose which of those businesses are a you know, good use of my time or the best use of my time. So I will continue to do that. Whereas other people sort of get to a certain level and they coast, which I don't think is the right answer. I think, you know, even if doing more of what got you there is probably going to be productive. So you can really have the best you know, choice of which clients to work with. Well, you just said something interesting. I was happy to have a conversation with um, one of our magazine consultants about, or he's a pub, whatever publisher, but what you just said is good to great. Did you read that book? What's that? Good to great. Do you remember the book? Good to great. I mean, no. it's been, it's been a couple of decades maybe, but in the book, he says it's easier to be excellent than it is to be mediocre. No one calls the manager asking for the number six agent in the office to help them. They just don't, you know? So if you're number one, then people are, you're going to get more business just by virtue of being at the top. But again, no one calls looking for a pretty good agent. They want the best agent. If they're going to make the, the you know, the uh, effort to make that phone call to a manager or ask around, they're going to be asking who's the best person. So if you can get to that level, your business becomes much easier. And it doesn't have to be sort of the overall best agent. It can just be the best agent in your sub market too. So there's lots of opportunities for agents to do really well, you know, at many levels. That's a great point because a lot of people, especially newer people will say, well, I can't specialize because I'll eliminate too many opportunities when I don't have any. It's like you just eliminated your opportunities. Choose what to be best at, be best at it, and you'll have enough opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's always room at the top in any market, any market. Yeah. There's always room at the top in any market. Just choose the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. What has been your, and I mean, in 33 years, you might have a few, but what has been your biggest aha about business, about about being a real estate agent? Oh, clearly shifting from working with buyers to being a listing agent. No question whatsoever that that was clearly the biggest. Oh, yeah, that's how it's done. You know, looking around at the top and agents. Everybody knows office, that. Come on. <laughs> what's that? I'm giving you a hard time. I was like, everybody knows that. No, it took me longer than you'd think to figure that out there. I do know that now, but it took me way longer than, uh, than you would have thought to. When you got in this business, and not, I'm not trying to change your answer at all. I love that answer because I find some of the, that answer is so common. I mean, we've got hundred plus million dollar producers, almost every interviewee and every single, not everyone, but I bet half of them say, you know, one day I just realized I got to focus on listing properties. I'm like I got into this business only wanting to list properties, like, right. And then I realized I should represent buyers too. It would make me better at my craft. Yeah. Um, what do you, or, or in this business, 
we always learn from challenges. What has been your greatest lesson and or, and or biggest challenge to learn that lesson? Sure. So our market turned downward. I started in 1988. In 1990, we started into a really hard market for probably six years where it was, you know, a lot of the industry left Santa Barbara, a lot of industry left California. Um, and there wasn't really, you know, much to replace it there. So we had a lot of properties for sale, not very many buyers, declining values, very few sales, just a really, really tough. And this market. is what year again? 1990 to 1996. Okay. It was a very prolonged one. I was fairly new in the business then and it had shifted very rapidly from a strong seller's market to a strong buyer's market literally almost overnight. So being fairly new in the business and having taken on a lot of you know, debt to do the business, yeah. I had to try everything. So um, I, I feel like I, it was a big advantage for me to start during the slow time because I didn't know what didn't didn't work. And so I was willing to try everything and figure out what worked for me and what I was comfortable with. So I feel like I came out of that six years of downtime with a pretty big arsenal of at least potential things that I tried and you know could see if they worked in different situations where if you come in a good market, you know, you're sort of an order taker. You just write the list yeah. offer, or they'll take the listing and you don't have to have marketing or advertising skills or when to do price changes or a lot of different skills that you would learn in a, in a tough market. Um, and so I, I think that was very helpful for me to start in a sort of a, a down market there. It wasn't fun, but I think it was helpful. So rephrase that. So going through a tough market, you learned things you wouldn't have learned in a good market, because in a good market, sometimes you just become an order taker. Mm -hmm. However, what's a specific, like hone in on, is it about price reductions, how to win business, something about, you're a great negotiator. We've even touched on that, about negotiating, your biggest advice on negotiating even. So in negotiating, I would tell you that my biggest advice on that is to ask as many questions as you can and learn as much as you can about the people involved in the negotiations and what's motivating them. Because if you don't understand them and what's motivating them, you're not going to understand the negotiations. You're going to be sort of an outsider there. Whereas if you know, you know really what's going on with the people and what's important in their life and what's motivating them in this transaction, it allows you to be a much better negotiator. And one really good way to do that is to ask a lot of questions. Well, and that, to your point, I've learned that so often we assume what's motivating people and people may even assume what's motivating themselves, but what's really motive, what are they not telling us? Mm -hmm. um, but again, what's, ask a lot of questions and explore what's motivating them be curious, like just don't lose that curiosity, especially- And be a good listener. Yeah, be, once you ask the question, sit back and be a very good listener. Instead of again, just you know asking the question to ask the question, be a legitimate listener and let them open up and tell you so that you really have a good you know, understanding of what, what their situation is. Because you, know, you really have to put yourself in their situation as best you can to really help them. And so I think that's important is to really be a good listener. Do you have any fun stories or examples that you can give us of when you listened and there was this, oh, that's what's going on. And it kind of broke through the solution or anything else like that. I've had, situ I've had situations where I, 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 the other thing I would say is, you know, don't speak for your client. You know, don't assume that you know what is best for them and what they want to do there. So be humble about it and just say, you know, let me relay that to my client and see how they want to respond. Have an open discussion with them. Let them tell you how they want to respond. And oftentimes they'll surprise you, um, both buyers and sellers. I've had plenty of buyers where we get a counter offer back way higher than they said the top of their range was. And instead of me, you know, telling the other agent they won't take it, 
relaying it to them and being surprised when they take it. And then, you know, um, similarly sellers, you have people who, you know, absolutely aren't going to do that. You put it in front of them and they sleep on it and all of a sudden it looks pretty attractive. So um, yeah, keep, keep an open up. mind and, yeah. the, and an open dialogue. I think those are important factors there. Open mind and open dialogue. But what I really heard in that was in this business, stay curious and be humble. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. Isn't that interesting? Stay curious and be humble is really the advice I just heard in there, the things to value. And how often, not always, do things get contentious and egos come to rise? All the time. It, it's even from people who are very sophisticated and very accomplished in their careers, in their real estate transaction, it's a very emotional transaction and you'll see sides of them that you never knew and they probably never knew existed. So your job, at least I see my job is to be very neutral and not, got caught up, not get caught up in that emotion, but to be sort of the, you know, the stable voice of reason in the transaction there and not get caught up in that squabbling between buyer or seller or other agents also and, and really try to avoid that as much as possible and I think that's been very helpful my career is trying to be more level-headed and not as emotional about the transaction did you come into this business knowing that or did you did you figure that out figure that out yeah I did not come into it knowing it. how did you I, figure that out just watching and observing and seeing people and, you know, being surprised and, and then, you know, just sort of over time and hundreds of transactions and gradually learning it that, you know, my job and my role is to be, you know, more neutral in this and not get emotionally involved. And then I feel like I'm going to live longer too. I mean, you see other agents where they just get beat up in these transactions and they're teary and they're it's really beating them up right yeah they're beating themselves up at the end of the day and their job is not to get caught up in that so if they are getting caught up in that they're really not doing their job for the client yeah so uh, i'm a good observer of people so i'll watch and try to learn from other people's mistakes as much as from my own mistakes also i just i think you get to the you can get to the end quicker that way wow so we're going to get into our final three questions and these are supposed to take five minutes but sometimes they take longer because they get interesting all right the first of the final three questions in your successful career what have you found is your greatest resource for success greatest resource for success that is intentionally vague and abstract I, I would say that it's a really good work ethic um when i was when i was a Freshman in high school, I went away to a private boarding school and it was very competitive and I didn't start out getting particularly good grades there, but over time I improved my study habits and I learned really well. I left that school with exceptionally good study habits and those carried on through college and those carried on through law school. I think those have carried on through my career also. So I would say a really good work ethic um, has been probably my greatest asset. It's something I just heard. So you said work ethic, but in that you wrapped up. Some people hear work ethic and they're like, oh yeah, you just want to like work hard as if that's a bad thing. Back to excellence, not being as hard as medi mediocrity, but habits. It's when you work hard, you implement habits, which aren't hard, mm -hmm. which gets that compound effect of success. I get up at five in the morning. I go to the gym every morning. I get that checked out of the way and get in my office here. And I treat it like a job where I'm here eight to five every day and then do whatever I need to do before or after that, but plan on being here as much as possible. So I'm in that routine of working, you know, a lot of hours. Here's what everybody's asking and thinking when you just said that, what is your routine? What are your habits every day? So first thing, get up in the morning. Um, do a quick check of emails and uh, news articles and go to the gym, spend an hour at the gym, go home, have breakfast, uh, take my son to school, then go into the office. And you take a break for lunch every day, though. Um, I, I, I Again, I do not work through you know the straight. I take a break every single day for lunch. So it's a legitimate break and something that I look forward to doing. And it's a bit of a recharge also. So. I am definitely not one of those people who works through and skips lunch. That would 
that wouldn't work for me. Highly, highly organized and focused. Yeah. And, and fairly regimented in terms of the, you know, eight to five part of the day. The yeah. rest of it, I, I value my free time a lot. And so if I'm going to be doing something work related before or after that time, it better be really important because I put a high value on the things that I do before and after that time also. So I'll make exceptions, but it better be really important if I'm going to give up, you know, my free time for it. So you're focused on freedom, but you establish your freedom by setting boundaries that empower you to have it. Mm -hmm. In your day, you get up at five, you read the paper, you check the emails, you do the workout, you have the coffee, you take your son to school. How old is your son? Uh, the youngest one's 16 now. So he, he finally he should be driving. He doesn't quite have his license yet, but uh, up until recently. But how many? How many? So you said the youngest is 16. Between my wife and I, we have six children. So they range. No from wonder you paused. <laughs> they range from 16 to 30. So yeah. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So then when once that hits, it probably is number one, once you really hit the office, it's who you call, what you handle, what you're negotiating, what listings are coming up and delivering on those throughout the day. Is that I what make a doing? list each morning of priorities, what needs to be done, and then try to put them in a list of priorities. And then obviously you have to be flexible in this business because one phone call or one email can throw you off that track. But at least you start with what your goal of accomplishing is there. I think one other thing that's really important too is to start your morning with making your own list of what you want to accomplish because I think it's too easy and to get sucked into being a reactive agent and just responding to emails all day long and, and then responding to what everyone else wants you to do instead of planning what you want to accomplish. And again, I think that that's a mistake that a lot of people make is just being responsive and reactive instead of proactive. Exactly. exactly. Well, when you engage in a way that you're reacting, you're just setting yourself up for more reacting. Mm -hmm. All right, final two questions. The next question, what book has been life-changing for you and do we have to read to change our career and or life? Uh, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, by far and above the, my favorite book that I've ever read. And it was when I was in law school and my good friends recommended it to me. And I think if anybody recommends that book to you, take it as a compliment. It's a novel, it's very long, it's not for everybody. It's probably 1200 pages, but it's a fascinating novel. And it's just very inspiring in terms of putting value on accomplishment and achievement and um, just being a productive member of society. So excellent wow, book. I yeah. love that because I've, it's been recommended to me for a long time. It's a take it as a compliment if somebody re recommends that book. and. The reason my friend recommended, he said that there had been a, and this was probably 35 years ago, there was an interview of the um, CEOs of the top 500 companies in the country and asking them what was the most influential book in their life. And the Bible was number one. And this was number two, heads and shoulders above anything else. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm picking up that book. Yeah. Atlas Shrugged, everybody. Atlas and Shrugged. most people have heard of that book, probably. You should have. Yeah. Last question. Yes. If there's one thing, well, let me pause. I'm going to go back to Atlas Shrugged. What was your, you kind of told us, but what was your aha, really big takeaway from that book? Or what really changed you from before and after reading that book? So in that book there, in every book, there's heroes and villains. And in this book, the heroes are the industrialists, the producers in this country. And it takes place in probably the maybe 1950s or something. But I mean, the people who are in business and producing things are the heroes and the villains end up being the people from the government who are, they call them the moochers and the looters who are trying to take away from them things that they've produced there. So the oh, lady that's, who, my book. that's an Elon Musk book too, by the way. Okay. The late the lady who wrote it came from communist uh, Russia and you know came to the United States and was very anti-communism. And that's clearly her slant in the book there, but she was a famous philosopher and this was her sort of life work was writing this book. She'd she'd written other books like The Fountainhead that were very famous too, but this was her 
sort of a culmination of everything that uh, that she believed and she put into a new, into a thrilling novel. Wow, I can't wait to read this. It, My it, husband is one of the people that's told me over and over to read this book. So he's gonna, he's gonna, it's funny because I'll do things after maybe five or 10 other people give me the same advice. Mm -hmm. right? it, I just think it'll, it'll reaffirm things that yeah. you already believe in and values that you already have. Everybody, you got that? If you're listening to this podcast, you'll love that book. Atlas Shrugged, but thank Atlas you. Atlas Shrugged, yeah. Last question. If there's anything that we should leave this interviewing, interview remembering and never forget, if we're just going to have to forget everything else, what is it? Enjoy yourself still. You know, make sure that you still enjoy what you do and that you're doing a good job for your clients and that it's still fun for you. Because, I mean, you're doing this, you're spending more hours doing this than anything else in your life. So you better enjoy the people that you're working with and the career that you've chosen there because nothing's more important. If you're spending all your time doing something that you're resentful of, um, that's not right. So do make sure that you, you enjoy it. And I do. Yeah, life's too short. Life's too thank short. You, Dan. You're thank welcome, you. Jerry. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. How do I?